it any coincidence that three of the best shooting games ever made all came out on the same engine? I'm talking about Duke Nukem 3D, Shadow Warrior, and Blood. Now, Duke Nukem 3D and Shadow Warrior all got the HD treatment, with various versions all being released throughout the years, but for some reason it seemed that Blood missed out, mostly because a bunch of malakas kept holding out over the licensing. That's all changed because Night Dive Studios have managed to secure the rights to it amazingly. And finally, we have a proper remaster, and it's about damn time. Originally released in 1997, Blood is a first-person shooter developed by Monolith Productions, and one of the games that 30-year-old boomers just never shut the hell up about, but for good reason. Blood is just so fucking cool in so many ways, and it's still one of the best first-person shooters ever made. Everything about it just personifies what makes a 90s shooter so awesome, from the sound and the music, the highly detailed sprite work, the fantastic level design, through to a protagonist who you hardly ever see, but still manages to come across as an absolute badass. Oh, I won, I won, I won, I won, I won. In Blood, you take on the role of Caleb, a gunslinger who's a member of the Cabal cult. What is your bidding? In the opening of the game for no apparent reason, Caleb and his buddies are betrayed by the evil god Chernobog and Caleb is buried alive. Centuries later he awakens from his grave, pissed off, and sets out to get revenge. It's a simple premise, but like all good shooting games from the 1990s, it can be summed up in a single sentence. Like Duke Nukem has to save the planet from aliens, Lo Wang has to hunt down and kill Zilla, and Doom Guy has to rip and tear all the demons. Part of what made Blood stand out though is Caleb as a character, and a lot of that is due to the voice actor Stephen Waite, responsible for a lot of his mannerisms and his drawl speaking style. Open for business. Like blowing something up is always fun, but blowing something up as your character laughs diabolically is even better. <laughs> Aside from all that though, it's still a pretty damn good shooter. The rule of thumb here is that if it moves, you can shoot it. Almost everything you shoot in this game is going to react in one way or another. Often you can destroy entire sections of the map and blow holes through certain walls, like it's just awesome. And you'll be doing a lot of that throughout Caleb's journey. This journey takes place across five different episodes, each comprised of seven, eight, or nine levels. The first four episodes being from the original game and the fifth from the expansion pack, Plasma Pack. This remaster also comes with the other expansion pack as well, named Cryptic Passage, which includes another nine levels. And all of the environments you move through are influenced by countless horror films and literature. Like in the first level alone, there's references to Edgar Allan Poe, the film Phantasm, and of course, Army of Darkness. I live again. But there's also references to The Simpsons, Ace Ventura, and even Andrew Dice Clay. Like it's got a lot of humor despite appearing to be this pretty dark and spooky horror game. Fresh victims for the ever growing army of the undead. It's like watching a film like Reanimator or Return of the Living Dead. Like, yeah, it's violent and gruesome, but it also wants you to have fun, and that's exactly how it plays and feels. Who, who wins the hurting stuff? You'll take on evil cultists, giant spiders, gargoyles, and zombies, but it's all very self-aware and just has a real great sense of character and personality. When Caleb throws a bundle of dynamite into a group of enemies and laughs insanely, you'll probably laugh along too. The first episode might be some of the best old school level design, like, ever. You start off coming back to life and then murdering your way through a cemetery and a mausoleum. Then in the next level you're moving through a train station before then getting on that train and crashing it at a nearby carnival. Mm, this is better than cruel aid. After clearing out the carnival you move through a couple of temples before a boss fight against a giant stone gargoyle. Now this is just the first of six episodes. The fourth episode is pretty great too. The first level starts off in a very cliche evil scientist laboratory. Then later on in the episode, you'll move through a forest and a lake that's a direct homage to Friday the 13th. Fans of horror are just gonna revel in coming across all of these little homages and it still shines through now in 2019. It's just part of what I think makes this game so timeless. It also won't take long playing the game before you just notice how over the top it is. Every time you so much as shoot at an enemy, it sends out little jets of blood in all directions. And throwing an explosive at someone's often going to literally blow the flesh off their bones. At a time when shooting games just started to fall into this habit of reusing the same archetypes over and over, Blood seemed to do its best to shake things up a bit. 
Instead of a pistol, you had a flare gun, which could stick into enemies and then turn them on fire. Which point they'd run around screaming their head off. There was of course a shotgun, but I think Blood Shotgun stands out as one of the best in any FPS game. This thing is a fast firing sauna, where you can either fire a single barrel or both at once. A combo which at point blank range is pretty damn lethal. Then for the automatic weapon, you've got the Tommy Gun. The Napalm Launcher is Blood's rocket launcher, and not only does it do tremendous damage, but it can also set nearby enemies on fire from splash damage. It also fires super fast too, making it just this incredibly powerful addition. The Dynamite, however, is probably the most skill-based weapon in the game. Now, the way this one works is that you light the fuse and then hold down the fire button to charge up the distance that Caleb's gonna throw it. You can either throw it and let it detonate on impact, which is like the default attack, or you can use the alt fire, throw it, and wait for the fuse to run out, which is more useful for throwing things around corners. Like, it can be tricky to get the hang of at first, but once you master this thing, it's one of the most effective weapons you've got, and it never loses its usefulness. Not to mention, if you know where enemies are, you can throw it around corners to kill them before they've even seen you. The aerosol cam which you get in the later chapters functions like a flamethrower, but the alt fire for this thing allows it to be thrown, similar to the dynamite, so it's a skill you're gonna wanna get the hang of. Other than that, you've got the Tesla cannon, which is useful against pretty much everything. Then the last few weapons are a bit more occultish, like the voodoo doll, and then the life leech, which is a skull on a stick that shoots out fireballs or can be placed down like a turret. Even by today's standards, this is a pretty creative roster and it still stands the test of time as this bunch of really fun and enjoyable weapons to use. <laughs> Blood, I think, is probably the most challenging shooting game made on the build engine, and it offers up five difficulty modes. You've got still kicking, pink on the inside like your mum, lightly broiled, well done, and extra crispy. If you compare this to Doom, this is kind of the same as I'm Too Young to Die, right up to Ultraviolence. However, compared to the Ultraviolence mode in Doom, well done in Blood is way more challenging and borderline unbalanced. I do want to say too that I think that episode 1 is the hardest episode in the entire game because of the fact that you don't have many weapons for a whole lot of the earlier levels, and ammo can be hard to come by. So if this is the first time you're playing this, at least you can know that they're not making it easy for you from the get-go. Either way though, you'll probably notice this is a much harder game than Duke Nukem 3D or Shadow Warrior, and you're gonna die. A lot. <laughs> That's fine though, I mean, dying in an FPS game is part of the boom of life, but it might be a bit shocking just how quickly you can be killed at times. Lightly Broiled, I think, is the most balanced difficulty mode, because there's a good amount of enemies and they do reasonable damage. When you crank it up to well done and extra crispy, not only do the enemy counts increase a fair bit, but they also have higher health points and they can do more damage to Caleb. On Lightly Broiled, you can play it pretty much as a run and gun shooter, as long as your aim isn't terrible. And you can pretty much just blast your way through most levels without a problem. Once you step it up to well done though, you'll notice that cultists can start throwing entire dynamite bundles instead of a single stick. And that ramp up in challenge is gonna be dramatic. It almost entirely changes how the game needs to be played and to succeed, you almost need to memorize the placement of enemies and just quick save frequently. I guess my point is that if this is the first time you're playing this thing, it might be best to play it on Lightly Broiled. Don't be put off by playing it on what appears to be the medium difficulty. Like I said, this is a hard fucking game and you're going to figure that out soon enough. Now, there is a solution to all of this because they've included a highly customizable difficulty mode called Made to Order. With this, you can fine tune things like the enemy count through to the damage they do, even down to the aggressiveness of every single enemy type. And this is actually really awesome because it allows you to increase the enemy count to the point of the highest mode, but keep the damage they do at a somewhat fair and balanced level. So you don't get bodied the second you walk into a room inhabited by a bunch of enemies. But I guess most people don't really care about all that shit. What really matters is the remaster itself. And although there has been other fan-made remasters done in the past and some of them have been pretty good, none of them have been using the official source code. Running on something called the Kex engine, which was used for previous Night Dive games, this version by and large feels pretty damn good and close to the original. I think obviously the best thing is being able to run it at a high resolution with a high frame rate, but you can even modify the FOV as well. Not that it's really an issue for build engine games, but I mean, at least it's there, right? I think probably the best setting the remaster has is the option of this true 3D aiming in the controls menu, which removes that weird warping effect you get when looking up and down in the build engine games and this makes aiming just feel super smooth. 
Not to mention, it also makes it a lot easier to hit smaller enemies like the spiders and the rats, which have always been a bit of a colossal pain in the ass in the older builds of the game. Another option is to turn on anti-aliasing or ambient occlusion, which doesn't make a huge difference, but it does help to soften the shadows on certain things and can make the lighting look a bit better in certain situations. But it's really just more of a personal preference than anything else. I think it's also convenient how the remaster shows how much time a power-up's got left in the top right corner of the screen, which isn't mega useful or game-changing, but it's just a simple enough addition that's able to express more information to the player without bogging them down with a cluttered user interface. Now the downside is that this version isn't really aimed at the kind of people who've spent the last 10 or so years playing through Z-Blood, Blood GDX or Blood CM or whatever other remakes have been out there. And yes, I understand that playing Blood has been possible for all those years, but it hasn't always been this accessible. What this remaster has done is put all of that official content together in a neat little package. It even lets you load custom maps and mods through the main menu, which just gives me another reason to play through the Death Wish mod again. What's also good is that you're also gaining both expansion packs thrown in as well. So you've got Cryptic Passage, which I think came out in like mid-1997, and then Plasma Pack, which also came out late 1997. Now, opinions on these expansion packs are like assholes, and yeah, everyone's got one. Personally, I prefer Plasma Pack to Cryptic Passage, only because Plasma Pack was actually developed by Monolith Productions, whereas Cryptic Passage was developed by Sunstorm Interactive. These are the guys who did the Life's a Beach expansion for Duke Nukem 3D. And if you don't agree that Life's a Beach is the best expansion pack for Duke Nukem 3D, well, you're dead to me. You have such a big muscle. I think the problem with Cryptic Passage is that it lacks a lot of the dark humor elements from the original. At times, it's even more like straight up horror, with some dark and creepy environments set in more spooky and eerie locations, like an abandoned opera house and a graveyard. Makes sense though, I mean this whole episode is supposed to be set in Transylvania and the Carpathian Mountains. The last level is this huge and spooky castle, and if I saw Dracula creeping around the halls it wouldn't have surprised me. Plasma Pack on the other hand still retains that tongue in cheek vibe of the original making it more fun to play. Not to mention it also includes new cultist variants, carnivorous plants that shoot out acid or fire, and if you break any of the mirrors in the game, all of these mini Calebs run out and start attacking you. So overall, I think it just has a lot more going for it than Cryptic Passage. But still, both of these should be played and they're fantastic expansion packs. Aside from all the single player stuff, you can now play through the entire thing in co-op, which is just amazing. Every build engine game is incredibly fun in co-op mode and Blood is no exception. It's also got the return of the Bloodbath mode too. Though I can't really see it exploding and becoming this huge online scene like Overwatch or Rainbow Six Siege, but at least it's been added in. Whether or not you've heard about Blood, it's hard to ignore the influence it's had on the industry over the years. A recent game like Dusk, for instance, took pretty heavy influence from Blood in terms of the setting and the protagonist. And no doubt anyone who's played through this when they were younger, I think is going to be stoked to see this official remaster finally completed. And there's really no reason for me to not recommend this thing. What didn't I like about it? Well, I mean... Nothing. I like pretty much everything. I know, it's probably one of those very few times I play through a game and do a video where I just can't think of anything worthwhile to complain about. So here's the 411. The remaster is great. It's the original game made even more accessible, and that's nothing but a good thing as far as I'm concerned. If you've always wondered why 30-year-old boomers talk about old games like this all the time, well, playing this remaster is going to help put things into perspective. So go and buy it, bitch. Rest in pieces.